I guess we're live. So I'm just going to wait a couple, couple of seconds, a uh, couple of minutes probably uh, for people to trickle in and we can get going. Set a few things up. For those of you who are already here, not sure how many people are here. I don't know if there's a way to check that, but uh, welcome. And I hope you've had a chance to maybe take a look at the hack pack, maybe take a look at some of the code on GitHub uh, because we're gonna be working together to, to kind of change some of it today throughout the workshop. Not exactly sure how, how Hopin works. Like, I don't know if you're sitting there on the event and the stream starts or if uh, you join after the fact or something. Okay, so I've been given the go ahead to get started. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. Welcome to my workshop. This is game programming in C++. And I'm just gonna start by contextualizing some of what we're doing today. So most people would consider uh, what we're about to do or the game that we're working on or the code that we're, we're changing uh, to be kind of reinventing the wheel, right? Uh, so there's this interesting quote, you know, uh, with, from one of the game developers that I, I, I like kind of look up to, uh, which, which is uh, whoever came up with the phrase, don't reinvent the wheel, uh, did not even stop to think for five seconds about actual wheels in the actual world. Now, there's a lot of context to when he said this, but basically, uh, you know, if you look at, and I think the rest of the quote was something like, if NASA, NASA like didn't like slap bicycle wheels on the, on the Mars rover, you know, we're glad that they reinvented the wheel because the wheel that's needed for Mars is completely different than the one that's needed for a bicycle, right? And so that's kind of getting at the heart of what we're trying to do here. So when building games in something like C++, uh, it could be considered re reinventing the wheel because you're not using an existing game engine of which there are many. Um, and you're also kind of on your own in terms of uh, writing the technology. There's a lot of other details that C++ brings on in terms of uh, complexity. But the idea is we get some control and, and in this workshop, I'll be going over how you can actually have a very rewarding experience building games in C++ and also do it quickly um, using some structured approaches so let's just start. Um, so hi, my name is Apar, and I am a game developer, but also primarily currently a CTO of a stealth startup. Uh, so I've previously worked at, at companies like Ubisoft and Apple at both places, most of my co-ops actually, and I, I happen to be in, in a, a graduate from uh, the Waterloo Computer Science Program. Uh, most of my co-ops basically involved writing C++, and so I've spent quite a bit of time, I guess six or seven years, uh, working professionally with C++ and then, and then uh, before that for about three years, kind of just messing around with it on my own, making games in particular. So let's get going. So these are some of the games that I've worked on in C++ in particular. There's other games I've worked on and those are a little bit more uh, higher level on the stack, obviously fun time to develop in other game languages as well. But this is just a spectrum of the kinds of games that are possible, for example. So on the left here, we have uh, Watch Dogs Legion, which is a Ubisoft title. I was an engine programmer on, on their team uh, for one of my co-ops. And this was the game that I worked on. Now this is like a kind of very massive open world GTA style game. Uh, it's out now everywhere. It, I think it came out last year in October. So go ahead and play that. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of techniques that I gained from working on a scale. You know, this is like millions and millions of lines of code on the engine that we had here. Um, on the right, this is Citizens of Space, another game that I worked on. Now this is like an independent studio. Uh, we were like three programmers, uh, 10 people in total, including artists and level designers. And this is an RPG kind of game, much smaller in scale, but still had a lot of complexity to it. This shipped on a lot of consoles as well as Nintendo Switch. So go ahead and play that as well. Uh, and lastly, this game at the bottom is something I, I kind of worked on in high school on my own when uh, working with C++ and trying to get a good understanding. And so this is another game that I've coded in C++. And, and so the spectrum here is like millions to hundreds of thousands of lines of code to this is 5,000 lines of code, basically this game down here. And so you can see, you know, 
uh, what the kind of scale of possibilities with, with C++ are. Obviously the language is turned complete, so you can do anything you wanted, but anyways, the agenda for today's workshop will be to kind of go through an introduction and the structure of our code base before we kind of dive in and start working on the code itself. And then we're gonna break it apart into three different steps. So at the first layer, we're gonna actually implement a, a game feature and we're gonna do this using one of the systems that's built into the template. Uh, so the template that's provided with this workshop is essentially a skeleton of a game engine, which provides a simple game, a simple platformer game. And I'll be showing that in a second. So let's run the game and discuss its structure. So starting off, first of all, before we, we actually get into the, the code itself and running the game, uh, I'll just quickly discuss why we wanna use C++. So there's three main reasons why I like C++ as a programming language for solving these kinds of problems. So the first reason is that it provides low level control. And what does that mean? Basically, I get to choose, you know, essentially when I'm writing the code, uh, I, can, I can kind of control what's happening at the CPU level almost, right? I can say, I want to add two numbers together. Obviously nowadays, you know, things are a lot more complicated. If you're using libraries, or if you're using a lot of C++ features, a single line of code doesn't exactly map to a single instruction for the CPU. Uh, but the idea and the control is always there. You can always kind of dip down to that level if you needed to. But on the other hand, one of the nice things about C++ also is that I can build these high level abstractions on top of all that low level magic. So what's happening there is essentially I can write uh, really optimal, really performant code, but also have it be expressed in a succinct and kind of understandable, digestible way. And that scales across teams. So for example, at Ubisoft, we were uh, at, at 40, 50 people who were on the, on the engineering or the hard tech level. And then there were 600 people on the content side of things uh, for Watch Dogs Legion. And so, all of those people interacted with the code base in some way um, or the tools that were built using the code base. And so finally, this kind of low level control with high level abstraction produces a lot of meta problems. And, and we'll get into that in a, in a second, but basically in C++, you're often trying to find ways to take these concepts that have are like a writing high performance code, but also expressing it in a way that's really easy to use. And this is a constant meta problem, so to speak. So it's not the direct problem you're trying to solve. This is not like, like I'm not writing a function to add two numbers here. I'm trying to write, figure out a good way to write that in a way that's performant, but also high level. So that's that I find pretty fun. And we'll see uh, you know, some of that in our code here as well. So the project structure diving right in, uh, we have basically, if I open up the code, might as well at this point, um, I'll start by running the game. So this is the game. If you've copied or if you've uh, cloned the actual uh, repo and compiled the game, this is what you should see, see when you run it. Uh, basically, it just has a few simple features, a character that can jump around. I'm using WASD to, to run around and jump and J to shoot. Also, I can use arrow keys and Z. Uh, and there's these, the, the player character, obviously some enemies on the ground and you know some physics going on. Like I don't actually pass through the ground and stuff like that. I can jump, I can only jump when I'm on the ground and so forth. So a uh, very quick overview and I can, let's run LS. Uh, you know, this, the structure of the directory you'll find is like very flat. Right, everything is kind of put into the exact same directory. And this is actually significant. So the reason why I do this uh, in particular is because basically, you know, what, what I try to treat my code as is like every single file almost is its own module, right? The smallest unit of code that I wanna be reasoning about categorizing at a given time is one file. And the reason why I do that is because it gives me the flexibility later to kind of build my structure up rather than imposing a structure in advance on my, on my project. Uh, and this is very valuable for rapid iteration. So I'm not sitting here thinking like, oh, I'm gonna make like a UI folder and then a da data folder and then like a textures folder and the data folder and all these things and, and trying to do this like top down structuring. I'm just writing these files and then arranging them in a way that, uh, that makes sense. So let's move forward now. When you're building video games, uh, if you've had some experience with this, you'll be familiar with the concept of game loop. But basically all games kind of, the way that they give the appearance of smooth animation is they're essentially running very, very rapidly. They're, they're basically 60 times a second, usually presenting a new screen to the player. And what that means is since that's faster than our eye can kind of tell uh, motion apart, uh, if things move on the screen each time, you know, each one of these 60 screens, uh, it will appear to be moving very smoothly. This is literally how films work as well. So not a very you know, amazing or, or groundbreaking concept there, but the important aspects of this game loop is that we start by processing input. So when whatever the input that the player, you know, in this case, WASD, for example, uh, whatever they provided, we take that and then we update the game state. There happens to be some idea of what's happening in the game. 
and one second. Once we've kind of processed the input, updated the game state, um, so the player's position, the enemy's position, and among other things, we then render the game. And rendering is just the process of taking the game data and then presenting it to the screen. And again, we're doing this many times a second. One such iteration of this loop comprises a frame. So you'll be uh, hearing about frames per second uh, pretty often. And so another reason, another part of this game loop is that we actually, um, the computer you're running a game on is obviously gonna run things at different, different rates. Essentially, you could either run at like 30 FPS. Let's, let's say you're running like your Google Chrome or something and it starts hogging all the memory. Suddenly your game's gonna run a lot slower. But the problem is a lot of the code that we're writing, especially physics code, doesn't really play too nicely with the game running at very highly variable rates. And so inside our main game loop, we actually have some code that measures how long uh, has, has elapsed between the current frame and the last frame and simulates everything at a fixed time step. And this is very, very crucial for, for having very predictable uh, physics, for example. And this inner loop we'll see runs at 60 frames per second. So again, a frame is one iteration of the game loop. 60 frames per second means that, you know, that's happening 60 times every second. So moving forward, um, let's open up the game. So if we look at the, the directory structure here, you'll see a lot of files that have component in their name and a bunch of files that have system in their name as well. And then this concept of an entity. So what are entities? An entity is anything that operates in the simulation that's, that makes up the game. So essentially the entire game is comprised of, you know, the player, the enemies, the ground and, and all these things. And what those are, are basically these things called entities. And then the way that these entities work is they have things called components attached to them. Components are just data. And systems are things that uh, code pieces, basically, that, that take in this, these entities and, and um, simulate them, update their data, and then present them to the screen. And a world contains these entities. And this is, this is something you'll find pretty often um, in recent game engine literature, if there is such a thing. Um, this is referred to as an entity component system architecture. And it's super valuable for rapid iteration. And the reason why is because it allows you to basically build up your game or the things inside your game in your simulation uh, out of building blocks. So the player, uh, an example of this is the player. The player itself is made up of a few different components. The image component, the flipbook component, the image component just displays the player's like image. The flipbook component animates the player. So if, if I'm running, you'll see the player kind of doing a little running animation and the body component does the physics. So the jumping, the, the kind of the velocity and the, the hitting things and not passing through them, the gravity, all of that's handled by the body component or the, the systems associated with the body component. The platformer component handles the Mario logic. And so I just said Mario here, uh, but basically that's the stuff that's like going left and right and jumping and so forth. That's something that's gonna happen very often in the platformer. So I wanna separate that out. And then we have the player component, that's just player specific logic. Now. Uh, you'll see most of these components are actually completely unrelated to the player itself, right? And the nice thing about that is we'll actually be reusing a lot of these for, for example, the enemy and even for decorations in the game. The body component would work for anything that's physically involved, right? So again, examples of entities, the bullet that the player shoots is an entity, uh, the player itself is an entity, ground mover, this an enemy is an entity, and yeah. And then there's a bunch of other code in the game that's not entities and components and systems. These are like helpers, essentially, or things that, that facilitate the game in some way. These are engine features, maybe you could say, or framework features. And lastly, we have things called tweakers in the game. Actually, there's there's more than, than just that, but we have tweakers in the game. And this is, this is an interesting uh, feature of the game template itself uh, that we've built uh, for this workshop. Essentially, this lets me, if I'm running the game here, and I hop into the code. Let's say, let's say I'm not very happy with the, the speed at which the player is running around. So I can open up the player, uh, player system. This is what handles the player logic. And I can actually change this to, let's say, five. And suddenly, uh, uh, maybe that's a little bit fast. But you can see that you know, I didn't have to close the game. I didn't have to restart or anything. I didn't have to compile again, uh, you know, because that's annoying that that'll slow things down. Uh, compiling the code is, is you know, not very fun. You can't really do work when that's happening. And if you're a designer, especially, this is you know something you want to tweak all the time. So for things that you values you want to tweak often, we offer this macro. And basically, these are automatically reloaded as the game is running. Uh, I don't think I like that value. I'm going to change that back. Uh, it's a little bit fast for my taste. But yeah, tweakers, that's what those do. And then we have a thing called the entity factory. 
This is another piece of code, uh, entity factory ACP. This basically provides some functions to build these uh, pre-built entities. So a player, like I said, is made up of these building blocks. These functions just put those building blocks together to make a specific kind of entity. So yeah, very uh, pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll get into this more as we start coding. Uh, same with the physics system. The physics system actually is where all the logic for doing the physics, <laughs> obviously, uh, is handled. But in particular, there's a function in there called handle collision, uh, which is where we basically do all the logic for when two things touch in the game. And you'll find often in games, uh, you'll want to do a lot of specific logic that run, that happens when two things touch. And, and the, 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 when two um, objects collide, the term is collision, basically colliding uh, in, in physics and in game development, because we're writing physics, I guess, that kind of emulates real life physics. Uh, but again, this is not very fancy. This is just doing collision between two rectangles in the entire entire game template. There's nothing more than rectangles being, being uh, checked against each other. So uh, lastly, uh, we the way that we actually refer to things in the game, like referring to other entities, let's say you're a player and you want to remember the weapon you're holding in your hand or something, and that happens to be an entity, um, then you would store an ID instead of storing a pointer if you've written C++, which I presume you have uh, over the course of this uh, workshop, we'll be writing a lot of it. So basically in C++ you have pointers, these point to memory locations, but in the case of this game template, memory locations actually change all the time for entities. So we use IDs to refer to them. And these are unique numbers basically uh, that refer to an individual entity. And so later we can look up the entities using the ID. So now that we've done a really, really quick overview of the game structure, the code structure, the project structure, we can really quickly dive into building a feature. So let's implement player health and damage. So if I hop back to the game, uh, run it, you'll see this is not very interesting. You know, the player is, is getting touched by the enemy, but they're not really taking any damage. There's no real risk to this game. You can shoot the enemies and they die, but the player won't die. That's not very fun. Uh, and so let's implement player health, right? So the first thing we could do is add a health component to the player. So basically I mentioned the entity factory earlier. We have a factory function for the player and that's where we will add this. So hopping back to the code base, uh, let's open up the entity factory C++ file and here, uh, I can see that the player, as I mentioned earlier, is made up of, of a bunch of components. They're made up of an image component, a uh, body component, uh, flipbook, et cetera. And what we're gonna add now is the health component. This is something that's already built into the, the template. Uh, and this is used for the enemy, en enemy's health. And we're gonna set the player's HP to, let's say, let's say we set it to five, right? So they can take five hits before they die. And I'm just gonna cast, it to, cast this to an integer. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because HTN tweak, this macro always gives us back a floating point value and HP is an integer. And another thing I'm gonna do, the health component offers a couple of fields. So let's open up the health component header file. So again, I mentioned earlier, components are just data, pieces of data, right? And they don't really have any, any real uh, logic associated with them uh, directly at least, or if it is, it's very simple logic, right? Uh, just stuff that manipulates the data very, very straightforwardly. And the reason why is because the actual um, processing of entities and components happens in systems, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll get a feel for this as we build our own. So right now we're just gonna use this health component and we're gonna look at what, what, what it offers us. In this case, we have the HP, which is how much how many health points uh, the entity has, and then invul invul time. This is how after, getting, after an entity gets damaged, so let's say the player uh, gets hurt by the enemy, I can actually make them invulnerable for a period of time. And I'm gonna make the player invulnerable for two seconds, right? So, so for that period of time, they won't actually get hurt. So we've added the health component to the player and we, we created the health component here. And now we can just add it by doing this um, entity.health is standard move. And then we move the health component into the player. Now we can compile the game and that should be relatively straightforward. And another thing we could do is actually compile using multiple cores, that should be even faster, and run the game. So I added the health component to the player, but nothing changed what's going on here. Uh, the Well, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the logic that has to do with when two things touch in the game is actually something you have to write yourself, right? So we wanna actually hurt the player when the enemy touches them. So, we're gonna go ahead and write that logic. We're gonna update the collision handler in the physics system to allow the enemy to one, pass through the player and two, actually hurt the player. So let's go back, let's open up our physics system and head to the handle collision method. 
to our function here. So we'll see there's a bunch of logic, you know, um, for handling when the player is on a ground or whatever, all these things. We can skip over that and focus on if the enemy, so if, if we're a player, or if we're, if we're the ground mo ground mover, which is what the enemy's component is. So if we take a look at the create enemy function here, or create uh, ground mover, ground enemy, the component that actually distinguishes an enemy enemy from the player is the ground mover component. And the reason I called it ground mover component is because it just moves on the ground left to right. So if we, A, the entity that is colliding with the other entity, B, is a ground mover, and the other entity is a player, so the ground mover just touched the player. And let's just say this only happens in the x-axis. So typically, collisions will happen both in the x-axis and the y-axis. And we have this Boolean uh, that tells us which axis the collision occurred in. So let's say the collision occurs in the x-axis. We are a ground mover. So I'm the enemy. I'm moving towards the player. I hit them. What we're going to do is we're going to subtract from the player's health. Uh, we're going to say B uh, health. We know B is a player. And I'm going to actually check that they, they actually have a, the, the player has a health component because I don't want to be like, if they don't have a component attached to them and I do operations on that component, that's actually going to crash the game. Uh, so this is one of the ways in which C++ is very fun, for example. Uh, and so we're going to check there that the health component exists and we're going to go ahead and damage uh, the player by one. And in addition to that, what we're going to do is we're going to return false. So you'll see some return statements in here. What actually happens is this handle collision function, um, the idea with this is that it will return true if you want the collision to sort of occur, right? Uh, but if you return false from this function, the objects, the two objects in question that are, are, are colliding will pass through each other. And so that's nice in the case where we want to ignore the collision, for example. And we actually do that. Uh, that's one of the cases, one of the cases we're doing that is here. Uh, so yeah. And another thing I want to do is actually if the, collision is occurring in the x-axis and we are a player. And the other thing is the enemy. We're actually just going to ignore the collision as well. So again, x-axis, so moving left and right. And then I'm a player. The other thing is the enemy. I'm going to ignore the collision. And we'll actually see there's a method, the damage method on the health component. What that does is it returns a Boolean. And what it returns is it returns true if, the, if we actually manage to hurt the, hurt the player. right? Uh, because the player might be invulnerable, like I mentioned earlier, because we've set that invulnerability time on them. If they got hurt for two seconds, they can't get hurt again. And so we're actually going to say, uh, you know, this, we don't really care about that right now. Uh, we're going to compile this and run this. And hopefully the player gets hurt when I, when I damage them, when the, when they touch the enemy. So let's see, there we go. So the player's taking damage, you know, whenever they, they touch this enemy and we'll see actually after four, that's, that should be four. Five, the, enemy, the player dies. Oh no, <laughs> right. So we have, you know, this is a significant feature in the game. Now there's actual stakes in a sense. Uh, so I want to kill the enemies before they, they touch me. Very cool. So heading back to what's next. Now the player has a way to get hurt, but there's no way for me to regain the health that I've actually lost. And that's no good, that's no fun, right? I can't like, make any progress if I'm, I'm constantly scared of dying at one health because I took too much damage at the beginning of the level. So let's, uh, let's, let's fix that. Uh, so let's add a mushroom to the game. And this is basically uh, gonna be an entity that when the player touches, they will consume it and it will add to their HP. And for doing this, there's nothing in the, in the engine that exists that lets you do this. There's no existing component that does this. So we're gonna actually have to make a component here. So let's create the health regen component. So again, let's create a new component that allows entities that touch it to regain health. We'll make that amount, that, that, that the amount of health that's regained, we'll make that adjustable. So again, components are just data. We're gonna make a new uh, component just by copying the health component, the header file, and make another component header file called health regen component. Okay, so let's open that up. Health regen component. All right, and then we'll rename this. And I'll get rid of all the other fields. I don't really care about those. That's not really necessary for what I'm doing here. Uh, and I'm going to set the amount of health that I can regain when I touch one of these to one by default. So if I touch an, uh, anything that has a health regen component, uh, I want the, in, the entity's in health 
to be incremented by whatever this amount is, and that's going to be one by default. So we've created this component. Um, and another thing we need to do is we actually need to go into the entity header file, and we need to allow it to be attached to the entity. So the way this is one of the internals of the engine, the way that entities actually work and the way that this component entity component system is, is set up is every entity actually just has a bunch of optional components on it, right? So all of these are, are the different possible components that you can have on an entity, the image, flipbook, platformer, et cetera. All of them are actually just stored here uh, with a flag that says whether or not this component is attached. That's what standard optional, this particular, this uh, little syntax, this, this class does. And this is a feature in C++ 17. So this is a relatively recent modern feature that, that we're making use of to simplify our code. And it's still fairly performant and it doesn't use extra memory or, or data uh, than you know, writing a Boolean flag ourselves. So let's include our health regen component here. And we're going to add it to the list of components that can be attached to an entity. Health regen component. We're going to call that health regen. Cool. So now we're going to make again just to make sure everything's everything's correct there. Uh, and the reason why a lot of files are compiling now is because I've modified something that's used by a lot of files. Again, I'm going to do multi-core compilation there with dash j4 a lot faster. So we have the health region component added, and now we're going to load up a mushroom image and create an entity factory function for it. So there's already a image in the data folder of the game called mushroom.png. And that's what we're going to be using to represent one of these, uh, these health regen mushroom things. So yeah, let's open up the entity factory. And we're going to add create mushroom. And we're just going to put it at a given position. So. Whoever calls this create mushroom function, uh, they'll give us the position where they want to place that mushroom. So going into the CPP file for this, uh, create mushroom. It receives a position. And I'm just going to copy some of the code from up here. As far as the, the mushroom is concerned, all it, is, all it has is an image. And the image itself should be loaded in the header file assets. This, this header file stores. This particular structure, assets, stores uh, stores all the images we have loaded in the game, as well as flipbooks, and, uh, among other things. So we're going to add a new uh, new asset or image here called mushroom. And then in the CPP file for this, we're going to load that up. So in the constructor of assets, we're going to add mushroom is make shared image and load that from data mushroom.png. And just, just for completeness, let's take a look at that image just to make sure we have it. I'll pull it up on the side here. Uh, so in my file system, data, again, everything is in data, mushroom.png. Very cool. This is the mushroom. It's a 16 by 16 pixels image. Obviously, the game is a pixel art game. So very small numbers here. All right, we've loaded up the image. and. Here, we're going to, instead of using the ground enemy image, we're going to use the mushroom image. So now we have the image component set up. Next, we're going to set a body component on the, on, the, on the mushroom because the mushroom actually is going to have a physics, it's going to have physics on it. And we're going to set the position of the body, uh, body.rect. This is the rectangle of the body. We're going to set it to the, the position that's given to us. And we're going to set the size to 16 by 16, just for sim simplicity right now even though that's going to be a lot bigger than the actual image. Because if we look at the image, there's a lot of empty space here, but that's fine. The, the box that surrounds this is going to be exactly like whatever this image shows. All right. So now, uh, by the way, if you have any questions, please ask in the Sli Slido link. Uh, there are, I'll go over them whenever we get the chance to. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't look like there are questions at the moment. So yeah, um, moving forward from that, we have set up the body component. We set up the image component. And lastly, we want to set up the health regen component. This is the component we just created. So health regen. And for now, we'll say the amount that it regens is one. But that's something we can tweak later on. And return entity. Before we actually return the entity, though, we want to attach all these components. So let's do that. Let's also take a sip of some tea. The image component the body component, and the health region component. 
All right, so we've created the function, the factory function for this mushroom. We've attached all the components to it. And I'm gonna go back into my main file or into the level file, uh, whichever one, depending on when you checked out the repo. Uh, and I'm gonna actually add this entity to the world. So I'm gonna say, again, a world just contains entities. Uh, and the way we add an entity to the world is we call add next frame. And we pass in the entity that we wanna create. In this case, I'll call create mushroom and I'll pass in the position. Let's just put it at 150 and see what happens. I'm gonna compile. I'm gonna compile faster and we're gonna go ahead and run the game. Okay, cool. So that's the mushroom. Uh, you'll see that it it's basically acting like a big solid, just absolutely useless hunk of fungi, fungi I guess. Uh, it's not really interacting with the player. And again, this is where we come back to actually writing the collision logic for things. So you can kind of break things apart into if, if there was a process for it, uh, you know, setting up the components, setting up the factory, and then kind of, set, you know, actually setting up the logic. So going back to our code, we're gonna head back to the collision handler that's in the physics system, handle collision. And we're gonna say, okay, if, if we're colliding, if the if um, if the other thing, if I have a health component, right, and then the other thing happens to be something that has a health regen component. So in this case, you know, let's say I'm the player. I I know I have a health component because we just added a health component to the player, and the other thing happens to have a health regen component. In this case, the mushroom. I'm going to actually increment the health by whatever the health regen component amount is. I'm also going to return false because I want to make it look like, you know, like I don't want to, I don't want the collision to actually stop the player, for example, in their tracks. And lastly, I'm actually going to remove uh, the other thing, in this case, the mushroom. I'm going to set alive to false. So yeah, what this basically will do is the health on the player should go up and the health on the other, the mushroom should disappear. So we've, we've built that. Let's compile and run the game. Okay, so we've compiled and, oh, look at that. It looks like the mushroom was just picked up by our enemy, but that doesn't make any sense because, wait, what just happened there? So if we go back, uh, back to our slide deck, I've anticipated this because I made the workshop. Uh, basically, this is an example of emergent behavior. We've built components, right, that have interactions between them. In this case, the health component and the health regen component but we haven't necessarily specified any logic for pertaining to the player or the enemy. And so what we've done is because of this architecture, we've essentially built up a system in our game that allows anything that has health to be able to you know, recover health by touching a mushroom. And this is actually very cool because a lot of the fun game moments you might see in a lot of popular games are built on this principle of relatively unexpected, unexpected things like you want it adds immersion to your game if things or characters that you interact with in the world can do most of what you can, right? It makes you feel like it's more alive, right? So this is just one way that our technical feature, you know, when we were writing it, none of this really came to mind or was important for us, right? But when we actually play the game, this, this is nice, right? So yeah, that's a feature we just built. And I did notice that the enemy, when they did touch the, uh, touch the mushroom, they actually turned around. We don't want that. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna move that above this uh, above this piece of code. This piece of code actually handles the, the turning around logic for the ground mover. We'll see, you know, X axis ground mover uh, platformer, then change their direction. We want to do that after, after we've done the check for the health. And hopefully that should get rid of that. Uh, the enemy shouldn't turn around anymore. So they'll just pass right through, perfect. So yeah, uh, we've kind of refined that logic now and we'll move on to the last system that we'll be discussing in this workshop. So this is the particle systems feature we're gonna be building. And so, you know, games often have a series of, of systems that, that they're built out of. You know, we've built a couple of things so far, just to provide some context. We have built a health component, which will allow, you know, entities, well, we actually already had the health component. We added the health component to the player. This just gives the player health, right? And it allows the player to take damage. Uh, 
um, among other things. But in addition to that, we built the health region component. And this, when we attach it to an entity, if other things touch that entity, they will be able to regain health. Uh, I can even actually, for fun, for a fun time, I can I can go back to my entity factory, and I can put the health regen component on the enemy and see what happens. You know, now if the player touches the enemy, uh, they'll they'll probably actually regain health instead of losing health. But then they touch, and then anyways, that's that that would be a fun thing to try. For example, right, like mixing and matching with these components can lead to a lot of interesting, interesting and fun behavior. Um, yeah, but. So we've built kind of two levels of things. First, we've just put together some components. Second, we've built a new component and added a new system uh, by changing the collision logic. But lastly, there's features that you might want to build that encompass a lot more, right? Or that um, are more or less related to the game level uh, logic of things. And one of those is particle systems. Particle systems are basically used to simulate you know, lots of small moving objects that have relatively minimal interaction with their surroundings. And the reason for this is because you want to make nice, fancy effects in your game sometimes, right? You want to have like smoke or fire or explosions or, or something like that. And, and the overhead of simulating these things as a, you know, like if I try to actually build these particle systems as entities, right? Like model every single piece of fire or smoke or whatever as an entity, uh, I'll run into some trouble pretty quickly because I might want to have like hundreds of thousands of these, right? And entities are much more featureful. They have a lot more logic associated with them. So you'll often run into performance problems doing this. And so that's why we're going to build this as a more low level feature. Um, so we work around this particular problem of performance by simulating these particles as their own special objects. And we're going to have a relatively optimal inner loop that, that simulates these, these particles, even though technically if you, if you were, you know, if you had an engine, maybe something that was super optimized for having hundreds and thousands of objects, you could use them for, for simulating particles. But yeah, in our case, uh, entities is not the, the right approach for, for doing something like this. So how do we actually do this? Let's, let's uh, head back to our code. This is going to be much more involved than the, the last two things we added, right? Uh, as soon as you start diving from, from game level features to engine features, the complexity usually goes up. But it's also very rewarding because particle systems can be used, for example, in many different situations for many different use cases uh, to add a lot of juice to the game. This is something if you're interested in engine programming, uh, you know that's this is something you might be doing often. Uh, but if you're interested more in the gameplay side of things, then the first two things that we did were more uh, more in line with with what uh, what you might be doing in, in in like a AAA game studio. If you're doing an independent game studio, you're probably going to be doing everything. Uh, so yeah. That's something to keep in mind. So how should we approach building this particle system? So like I said, we're going to have a bunch of particles. These are just small, fat, like moving things, basically, that don't really interact with their environment. Uh, and we want to simulate lots of them. So I'm going to create a, a class, actually, for, for doing this called a particle manager. And I'm just going to make a header file for this. And I'm going to start it from scratch here and put it in my hack the north namespace, because the entire engine, all of the code of the game, is put into inside this HTN namespace, and I'm going to call this particle manager. So what exactly is a particle? I'm going to specify that with its own structure called particle. And inside it, a particle has a position. So this is a vec2f pose, and I'll go over what vec2f is. And also, it has a velocity. And you know, if you want to be ambitious, we could also have a color on the actual particle that changes over time, for example. And lastly, typically what happens is particles after they're, they're simulated for a period of time, they disappear or they die. So I'll have some time remaining on each particle, right? So how long the particle has left to live. And in this case, it's going to be actually frames remaining. We'll see why in a second. Set that to zero. Yeah. OK. Looks like we have a question. So uh, yeah, uh, basically, again, what game engine is this? Is this a custom, custom engine? Uh, let me pull that up. There is, uh, yeah, this is a com fairly, well, like it's completely custom. Basically, if you clone the, the code that uh, comes along with this workshop, uh, you'll see that you know basically um, all of the code that, that's running the game is available right there, uh, except for a few simple things like drawing graphics to the screen. Uh, most of it is, is handwritten. We're using a library to actually 
open up a window and put pixels on the screen. But other than that, everything is, is done by us. Um, and again, for those of you who have questions, feel free to use the Slido link um, that's, or, or the Slido button, I guess, and hop in uh, to access and, and ask questions. Yeah, uh, and, and by the way, there are hack packs that are provided uh, with this, these workshops, and that has a lot more detail on how you can clone the code and compile the code for your particular platform. Um, we support Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, OK, moving forward, uh, I'm going to put all of these particles into a vector. And again, a vector is just a collection and a dynamic list of things. And I'm going to call this parts. And I'm following like a naming convention that I tend to follow uh, for member variables, m underscore. And everything you'll see is basically underscores and snake case, basically. And then classes are capital letters. Uh, and again, I'll go over what vec2f is. So we actually have a helper class in this engine called vec2. Uh, this represents basically uh, two-dimensional points or two-dimensional vectors. And this is a very useful thing because a lot of 2D game logic revolves around manipulating two-dimensional positions, as you can imagine. And in this case, uh, this is a position, this is a velocity, and color is a just color. It's a four RGBA kind of thing. So if you're familiar with like Photoshop or if you've used one of these softwares, num colors are typically specified as four numbers, red, green, blue, uh, and alpha. Alpha being how opaque a given color is. So we've set up the data model for our particles. We have the position, velocity, and color. Now, moving forward, the particle manager itself, uh, we're going to add a method to it called emit. And what does this do? Well, we probably want to allow users of this particle manager class to spray or like create a whole bunch of particles at the same time. So I'm going to receive how many particles uh, I can create. In this case, it's going to be an unsigned integer particle count. And let's just call that count for brevity. And then also maybe the position where I want to actually create these, right? The or original position for these. And then lastly, the color. And you know, right now, what I'll say is I'll probably say like emit, uh, you know, the, the actual emission logic will, will, will hard code it. But you know, in the future, you might want to add more parameters uh, for let's say, you know, I want the particles to spray out to the right or the left, or I want their initial velocity to be in this range or whatever. All of those things are should be stuff that could be adjusted. And if we have time, we could always uh, add those features. But anyways, emit particles. Next, we need some way to simulate all the particles. So we're going to have a function called simulate. This will just do the processing, uh, you know, and of the physics logic associated with the particles. And then lastly, we're going to render, uh, render the actual particles and this is going to receive a class called renderer. And what the renderer is, is it's basically a, um, a engine level class that I was talking about earlier. This is not related to the entity component system or whatever. This is completely different. This is a class which just has a bunch of methods to, and actually we can just open it up, open up the renderer. All it does is it has a bunch of methods to fill rectangles, put images on the screen, draw some text and so forth. So stuff that you can imagine, um, you know, you'll need for a 2D game uh, to render graphics. So again, we, we, we have this kind of dichotomy between stuff that modifies the game state and then stuff that draws to the screen, which in this case is rendered. All right, so we have set up the skeleton of our, or the header file for our particle manager. We're gonna go ahead and set up the, the CPP file. So particle manager and let me check the Slido for any questions. Don't think we have any at the moment. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, this is a custom engine. Okay, so we're gonna write the, we're gonna start with the method to emit particles. Position, color, colon. And I forgot to include a few things here. Um, we want to include the vec2 header because otherwise it won't recognize what vector2 is. And we want to include the color header uh, for similar reasons, because we're using both of them here. OK, and now I'm going to leave this blank for now, because this is a little bit more complicated than the other ones. Uh, simulate. And last one is render. Cool. So let's start with the particle simulation. Let me zoom in a little bit, actually, into the code, because it might be a little bit hard to see uh, for some people. <clears throat> 
we're going to loop through all the particles. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the position of the particle, and we're going to move it by the velocity. All right. That seems pretty straightforward, right? Like in, in high school physics, you learn, um, you know, the, the laws of motion or something. Um, and typically objects in motion, like remain in motion, blah, 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 those things. And so there's, there's uh, formulas that can describe the motion of a particle with a given, or, or, an, or a body rather, uh, with a given velocity. And typically what happens is uh, you integrate the velocity to get the, the position of an object or body. And so we're doing that here. We're just doing that numerically. We're doing that by like doing it many times every second. So add the velocity here. Um, and then another thing we're gonna do is actually, we're gonna receive in here a vector two. And I'm gonna call this grab Excel. This is the acceleration due to gravity that we want to simulate with. So we're gonna say velocity, we add the gravity acceleration uh, to the velocity. So again, move the position by velocity, integrate the velocity to get the position. Uh, integrate the acceleration to get the velocity. So fairly straightforward. Um, nothing super fancy going on here. So again, like I was mentioning earlier, particle systems, we want hundreds of these things, thousands of these particles. And so this is a really, really simple optimal loop. It's not doing all the things that like an entity would be doing. All it's doing is just two kind of additions, right? Or, or in this case, four additions. And that, that, that a CPU can churn through that like at the rate of like billions a second. So we should be okay on that front. And next, for actually drawing or rendering these particles, uh, there's a couple of things we need. Actually, we received a renderer here, but another thing we'll need is the camera offset. And to kind of explain that a little bit, I'm gonna go back to the game. So opening up the game, you'll see that actually, um, as I move around, the player, like the, the world, like you can imagine there's a virtual camera kind of following the player. And the way that that works is there's an offset you can imagine there is a kind of point up here that is representing what the offset of the world is relative to um, the player, right? And what that's gonna do is basically every everything you see in the game is gonna have its position subtracted by the camera offset. Essentially in this game or in this engine and in a lot of, in all game engines basically, the way you simulate uh, motion or, or kind of this, this virtual viewport is by shifting everything around you. It's just like, you know, if you look out the window in a, in a like you're, you're in a subway train or something or, or on a train, the world, like as far as you're concerned, the world is like, if, if you were completely stationary, but the world around you is moving at like hundred miles an hour, you would think you're moving at hundred miles an hour. And so same thing's happening here. When we're drawing graphics to the screen, we're actually subtracting the camera offset uh, from them to make it appear like it's, it's moving around. Really, they're all at the same position at the same time, all the time. Um, at least those blocks, the players moving around, the enemies are moving around and so forth. So we're receiving a camera offset here because we want the particles to be drawn with an offset as well. Uh, we want them to follow the camera, right? Or not follow the camera, we want them to kind of respect the, the camera offset. So that'll make more sense as we uh, run through this example. So again, we're gonna loop through all the particles and we're gonna, and actually I think we can make this a const method and what that means in C++ is that we're not gonna modify any of the members. So we're not gonna modify any of the particles in this case when we're rendering them, uh, which is a good contract to put up because in general, you want to indicate, I have a question it looks like, okay. So what IDE am I using is the question. And uh, the question, okay, so this is Vim. It's not really an IDE, I guess. It's just a text editor um, and I use, uh, I don't really use many plugins for this. Uh, I just kind of have used some of the built-in Vim features to do things. And yeah, uh, this is a, a color scheme that, that, that I really like, um, but nothing, nothing really fancy going on here. This is just a text editor that's built into Linux and probably Mac as well. Um, I can send over, I'll be putting up some of the files that I use for Vim if, if that's interesting to anyone. But other than that, this really straightforward, just. If you go into your terminal and write Vim, you already have it probably. Okay, so particles, back to particles, rendering particles to the screen. Uh, we're gonna draw rectangles for every single particle and actually we're gonna fill them. So call renderer.fill uh, p and let's open up the renderer header file 
we'll receive that. Uh, we'll see that the fill method actually receives a rectangle. Oh, another question: What coding practices should I use if I want to be a successful game developer? So that's an interesting question. Uh, fairly involved, I would say. But I think having a strong understanding of like general software engineering principles is always valuable, right? You can you can get really really far not doing that, like just doing the thing. Uh, just writing code to make a game work. And that's generally actually what you want to be doing at the beginning. You want to be writing these games. And eventually what will happen is you'll start noticing like certain patterns in your code that you're, you're doing. Like, like, for example, you know, uh, for representing objects in the game, uh, you'll often find that a lot of objects have a lot of similarities between them, right? Like everything has a position, everything has some velocity, maybe they all, they're all physical objects, so they all have physics and stuff. And you want to start adding some structure to your code. So reading, uh, there's a lot of books on this. I think in the additional resources at the end of the slides, as well as uh, in the hack pack, I highly recommend. There's a book called Game Programming Patterns, which goes over a lot of kind of object-oriented programming principles or other principles that can be used to, that I think definitely exactly answer your question. So Game Programming uh, Patterns, name of the book. Uh, it's by a author called Bob Nystrom, and they have a lot of really good content on their blog as well about uh, structure in game programming and stuff. But a lot of it is learned from, you know, just doing, uh, writing a lot of games and stuff. Uh, and in general, you want to sort of be careful about over-engineering because that's, that's, a, that's a serious problem. And so that's why, for example, in reality, this engine isn't very complicated at all. Like I'm literally just putting, like this whole component system that I'm describing is literally just a bunch of, bunch of stuff put into a struct, right? Like this is not something super fancy, uh, nothing like, this is not, you know, like PhD computer science stuff going on here. This is just simple. I'm putting things into a structure, and then I'm writing functions that do things on those structures. Uh, and you know, where possible, I try to like um, build these these classes and objects that that have some responsibility and, and you know fulfill a fulfill a purpose. So like the renderer will render graphics to the screen, and having an intuition for for you know when you want to break things apart versus when you want to uh, build things like or like leave it kind of unstructured. I think the best approach is to start unstructured and then you'll start having an intuition eventually about what needs to be refactored, for example. So start just by writing a game, you know, put everything in your main function or whatever, and you'll, you'll very quickly start seeing problems with that. So you wanna factor things into functions and eventually you might wanna factor things into classes that are reusable and then, you know, look at some books for guidance and stuff for how other people have done this. Um, and eventually you'll start getting a feel for, um, where you should where you should engineer over engineer I guess versus not uh, over engineer, but it's really it's 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 a fairly complex like complicated problem right to answer in general. But game programming patterns, um, very good book. All right, so we're gonna render a, a rectangle at the particles camera position uh, p position y, and we're gonna subtract the camera offset as I mentioned earlier. The way we actually represent you know this virtual camera is by subtracting its offset from everything. Cool. So. One more thing that I care about actually is uh, if we open up the particle manager header file, you'll see that I haven't specified the size of the particle anywhere here. Uh, for simplicity, just for the sake of the workshop, I'm gonna make the size a tweakable constant. Uh, every particle is gonna be two pixels large. And that's something we can, like I said, I'm using the HTN tweak here, so I can change that. And in order to use that macro, I need to include tweaker header, uh, tweaker HPP. And I'll also need the renderer here because I'm using it. Cool. And so size, size, and the color of these particles, I'll hard code this to be red right now, but uh, I could easily just have a color uh, and have a bunch of tweakers for that as well. And I could even animate, oh, actually no, the colors is in the, in the actual particle class, so I'll, I'll pass that through. Cool, so we've written the simulate method, we've written the render method, um, and we've written the emit method. And by the way, like I'm writing all these classes because like I know I've done this before, right? But it's not obvious that I need to write like a particle manager, like, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, this is just some, some something that comes with having some experience building these things that I, I know for a fact that if I wanna make a particle system, I, I would probably wanna encapsulate in this in a class, like something like a particle manager or whatever. Uh, so yeah, again, just try not to worry about it too much, write code add features and then factor and eventually an intuition gets built. And then again, uh, books and actually working on games. So uh, moving forward, we're gonna actually write the emit method. What, what does the emit method do? We're, we want it to spawn a whole bunch of particles, right? And then like 
give them initial velocity and position and stuff. So I'm going to loop through the count that's supplied here. And I'm going to actually create a particle, P, set its position to whatever the position we were given was, set its color to whatever the color was. And then the velocity is a little bit more interesting. So particles are typically, like they have a random velocity, right? That's what makes them interesting. Particle systems allow us to simulate things. If they all look the same every single time, it wouldn't be very fun, right? It wouldn't, that's not really how real particles in, uh, work, right? Uh, like dust in the air or smoke. It, it, the behavior, the, the motion is often very random. So we want to do the same thing here. And I actually want a kind of explosion behavior happening. So I'm going to give them some negative Y velocity. So in 2D games, typically, the axes are set up so that downwards or going down on the screen is positive Y and going right is positive X and left is negative X and up is negative Y. And so we're going to set the Y velocity to, um, and we're going to make these tweakable values. So I'm going to say Y speed tweak. Um, negative four. And we're going to have this be like a range. So min two, max four. We're going to say, um, and we're actually going to make a random, random, uh, use a random number generator, basically. And there's one built into the C standard library. So we're going to include that. This one's not very good. Uh, but it'll work for our purposes right now. And I'm actually gonna make a help, helper function called rand float. And this will return, and, and, and the syntax that I'm using here, this is a little bit interesting. So this is, this is what's called Lambda in C++. And it lets me create functions that are uh, anonymous. And what does that mean? Basically, they don't have a name. I can't like call them by name. They're, they're values. I can pass them around like, like objects um, in C++. Um, and the type that's returned or the type of this function is actually unspecified. So I have to use something called auto. Auto means that I want to let the compiler determine the type of this variable. So enough detail on that. A random floating point value. Uh, I'm going to call the rand function. And again, if I want to understand how this function works, so something that I often do, and that's that's highly recommended you do if uh, if you're writing C++, is you'll often need to refer to the documentation of the standard library. So here I have what's a website that I really like called cppreference.com and not to be confused with c++.com. So cppreference uh, just has a lot of details on it, almost everything in the standard library and also just C++ features, right? So if I look at C++ 17, this provides you know, the coverage uh, by a lot of compilers. I can look at uh, all these language features like what is an expression? Asi like lots of detail here, lots of really, really good detail. and and. You know, if you really get into C++, uh, you'll often find that getting very good at C++ often uh, requires sometimes a deep understanding of like the spec of C++. Lots of times you'll be having conversations with coworkers, uh, you know, who, who will almost quiz you like on, on these things. Um, and it's, it's an interesting kind of um, mindset that you have when you're writing C++. It, 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 uh, it very much encourages this deep understanding of, of how semantics and everything works, which is fun for a lot of people, uh, for myself included. So how do we create a random floating point value? I want to get a random float from 0 to 1. By the way, this function should return something from 0 to 1. So if I open up a CP reference and I search for rand, I'll see that this will actually return a value between 0 and rand max. And this is an integer that it's returning. Integers are not what I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to divide this by by rand at uh, rand by rand max and cast the return value of rand into a float and this will just normalize uh, whatever that that value is right this is going to give me a uniform uh, random distribution between 0 and 1 okay so now we have that and we can actually set the particle velocity uh, to something between let me just check for questions again nothing new yet cool so we want the velocity in the x axis to be something between uh, 0 Let's, let's do x speed min, let's say also 4, and y speed min, uh, x speed max 4. Cool. Uh, actually, 2, 4. And we, we can tweak these values at runtime. So 
let's go back here. Velocity, uh, we're going to say ran float. So again, this function is going to give us back a number between 0 and 1. We're going to subtract 0 0.5 from this, which will give us then ultimately a value between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And we're going to actually, yeah, sure. I'm going to, I'm going to use just one value for the x speed and one value for the y speed. So x speed, that's going to be the maximum speed. And then rand float uh, times, so between 0 and 1 times y speed. So what is this? And, and negative y speed, rather, because again, negative y goes up. So let's, let's quickly try and understand this. So rand float gives me a value between 0 and 1. I subtract 0 0.5. That's going to give me a value between negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Um, so we're just centering it on the origin. And x speed is 4 in this case. So ultimately, my x velocity is going to be either negative 4 all the way ranging up to 4. So the particle could be going left or right anywhere in between that range. And secondly, we have the y speed. And this could be anywhere between 0 and negative 2, um, ultimately. I'll set both of them to 2 for starters, uh, 4, 4, 2, whatever. You can mess with those values on your own. Cool. So we have the particle we created here. And I'm actually going to ac have to push this particle into my vector, right? Otherwise, it won't actually exist. So that is the particle manager class. Everything we need there, we have the emit method, the simulate, and the render. So now that we've created this, we haven't actually put it anywhere in the game. It's not even one of, it's not a component. It's not, a, it's not an entity. It's none of those things. It's just a simple class that uh, will simulate these particles. So to start off with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to head to my main file. And just for testing purposes, I'm going to grab that particle manager and just start using it directly. So I'm going to ignore all the other code that's here, create a particle manager. And I'm going to every single frame, right? So again, this loop, inner loop, runs at 60 FPS. This outer loop could run at any rate. depending on how fast our computer is running. So I want to I do things at a, at a fixed rate. I'm going to put the particle manager here. And actually, instead of putting it here, we're going to put it in the level class. Uh, so let me, let me grab that, move back to my level CPV file, header file, include the particle manager. And I'm going to use it here, particle manager, m particle manager. Cool. We have the particle manager set up there. Header file here. Oh, actually, I don't need to include that there. And what I'm going to do is every single frame, every 60 times a second, I'm going to emit one particle just to test this out. So it's going to look like a whole bunch of um, basically like a fountain, I hope. One emit one particle. We're going to put this at 50 50, and the color is going to be red. Uh, just to be sure, I'm going to include color as well. By the way, co the color header, if we take a look at that, just has a bunch of pre-made colors. You can add more of your own by writing you know, the syntax. And this is like not a good red color. This is like literally like red, red. Um, so whatever. But yeah, um, emit one particle every uh, 60 times a second. And in the render function of the level, I'm going to add uh, m particle manager render emit. I also need to actually simulate the particle manager. So let's do that. Uh, particle manager simulate. And I need to pass in the gravity acceleration, which I happen to have as a variable here already, uh, because I need the gravity acceleration to, to update the physics system as well. This function is doing the physics simulation. It also receives a gravity acceleration. So I'm just going to reuse that for the particles. Because why would the particles have different gravity than uh, the rest of the entities in the world, right? OK, lastly, render the particle uh, particle system. And I'm going to go to my render system, which is another member of this class, this render system. This is what manages the, the, the graphics and the, the, the actually drawing all of the entities to the screen. And it also manages the camera offset. So we're going to use that to get the camera offset from this uh, camera offset. And I think that should be everything we need. So I've saved that. I've em I emit particles every single frame. I simulate them, and then I render them.
And lastly, I'm going to open up my make file. This is what's used to compile the actual game. And I'm going to add my particle manager to this. So particle manager.o. And I'm going to go back to my terminal and make. So, and we're going to make fast, actually. <laughs> wow, so it compiles the first try. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, this will not most likely be the case most of the time you're writing code. I think I've literally done this a couple times now. So that's probably why. All right. So we have particles spawning, right? And it's basically like the fountain effect that we wanted. Um, and you'll see there's lots of them. And actually, right now, um, we're not removing the particles ever. Uh, they're just being created indefinitely. And I'm going to run out of memory if I leave this running for long enough. But the particles are only like, 16 bytes, so it'll take a long time before I actually run out of memory. And you'll see my FPS, like the game is not stuttering at all, even though I have like at this point probably thousands of these things um, being simulated. And that's because that inner loop that we created, the, the simulate function that we wrote for this is very, very simple. The CPU can crunch a lot of these particle simulations at the same time. And I'm not even compiling the game with optimizations enabled. So let's turn that off. And let's actually have the logic in place to kill the particles after they uh, after they expire. So I'm going to add. So again, if we if we look at the the particle, we'll see that it has a frames remaining, and we're going to change that to an unsigned vari variable um, or integer is fine. Uh, and we're going to set that to also be a random floating point value, and receive that. Ooh, I have a question. Somebody, oh, I guess this is more of a comment. Uh, it says, wow, it's a par. Wait, are you trying to build a game without using a game engine again? Uh, yes. Yes, we're building games without using a game engine. And that's kind of the point, I guess. Uh, it's, a, it's a very fun time. Um, yeah, so particle systems, frames remaining. We want to set a tweakable value for, I, you posted that question anonymously, so I don't know who you are, but hi. <laughs> uh, we're going to change this to an integer tweak. And this is, again, going to be the maximum number of frames that a particle is alive. We run at 60 frames per second. So two seconds is going to be like 120 frames, if my math is correct. So I'm going to set that as a maximum. The particles are going to live for two seconds at most. So. Ran float, again, between 0 and 1. Multiply that by frames remaining. And so that's going to give us a value between 0 and 120. So some particles will die early. Some particles will die late. And in simulate, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 1 from frames remaining. And then we're going to do an interesting thing. So I'm going to include a header called algorithm. And this is going to be useful if you're doing like an interview problem, like in first or like second year for like co-op, for example. Um, so you might be asked a question to remove all the all the elements from a, a vector or collection, like an array, dynamic array, uh, that match a particular criteria or are equal to a given value, right? So remove all the all the even numbers from this list, for example. And in C there is a built-in algorithm called remove if. Uh, or standard remove in general, which receives, in this case, two iterators. So my particles, the beginning of my, my list, and then the end of my list. And then I can give it a function that will actually tell it when two things match, So or when wh whether I should remove a given thing. So I'm going to say uh, particle. And I'm going to say if particles frames remaining is less than or equal to 0, I want to actually remove that thing. And this returns a given value. Um, called new end, uh, or I'll explain that in a second. But basically, this particular function, so the naive way of removing items from uh, from a list is to look at every single one. And then if they match, you will erase that particular element and then shift all the other elements over. And trivially, doing this gives you a runtime of on squared. right? So what that means is basically it's going to do for a list of 10,000 items, potentially uh, or a list of a thousand items can do potentially a million operations, right? Which in involves shifting all the elements over and so forth. Um, not literally, of course, but uh, on the order of a million operations, for example. Now, instead of doing that, what this standard remove if will do, it'll actually run in on time. And the way it does this is as it's moving forward um, in the list, 
it's shifting elements over one by one into the holes that are created by removing elements. And once it's done doing all that shifting, the shifting happens as it's traversing the list. Um, it actually gives you the new last element. It didn't, doesn't actually remove anything. It just shifts things over. And the, what's gonna end up happening is all the elements that, that uh, returned true, so all the things that return true, meaning all the things that should be removed, they get pushed to the end of the list. And now I actually need to erase them. So I have to say m parts erase new end and m parts end. So this is called the remove erase idiom. And uh, again, CPV reference, very useful. Remove if it explains a lot of this. So it says removing is done by shifting uh, the elements such a way that the elements are not removed appear at the beginning of the range and so forth. And it'll actually give you uh, complexity, you know, standard distance, and it'll actually give you a possible implementation as well. So if you want to memorize something for your first year interview problem, uh, here you go, I guess. But I, I highly recommend kind of getting an understanding of this as well, because this, this, this is a very useful concept. And if you're not writing C++, you might not want to memorize that particular piece of code. You might just want to understand the concept. Okay, cool. So we've done this remove. Uh, and now if I make the code, cool, we compiled first try. It should, the particle should be dying out. Yeah, so we can kind of, if you look closely, you can see some particles kind of just disappear. And this is gonna become more evident, I think, uh, if I go back to the thing, uh, change the tweakers and change this to, let's say, instead of 120, we're gonna change this to like 30. So like half a second. Yeah, there we go. So you'll see particles are dying immediately after. And the nice thing about this is, you know, we say we free up that memory, we free up that uh, processing power for simulating all those particles. This looks a little bit nicer. And so we've added particle systems to the game. And you can imagine, you know, this particle system is not really even, uh, it's not a component yet, it's just a class, right? Uh, we can't really put it on entities because there's no component that corresponds to it. So hopping back over to my slide deck. Uh, okay, so we don't have much to cover beyond this, but basically we're gonna add now uh, the particle systems as a potential entity or a component to the entity. So we're gonna say particle emitter uh, component, right? Similar to how we built the health region component. Now we're putting together a low level feature. So I'm, I'm on the engine team. I write the particle manager. Somebody's on like the mid level like gameplay team or something. They take my particle manager and they hook it up as a component, right? Or if I'm at an indie studio or if it's just me, I sit down here and I do all of those things because uh, that's <laughs> that's how programming works. So particle emitter component, and this particular part component will just have a particle manager on it. So the nice thing about separating these things, in addition to sort of you know allowing different teams to work on things, and like none of the code here has to do anything with components or entities or whatever. It can be reused in other projects as well that are using the same renderer, for example, and tweaker system. So manager, and I don't know if there's anything else I need here. Uh, oh, I do need an emit count, and I'll explain that in a second. So there we go, particle emitter component. And now we're gonna add something interesting. Uh, we're gonna open up our entity, first of all. We're gonna grab the particle emitter component in the header file. No questions at the moment. Particle emitter component, particle Emitter, same thing, we, the exact same thing we did for the health regen, right? And we're gonna go ahead and uh, create a particle emitter system this time. So like I mentioned earlier, there's a kind of trinity that goes on with, with this entity component system architecture, right? There are entities, which are just kind of data bags or like, yeah, basically just data bags, um, building, like they, they, they have building blocks, blocks attached to them. Then we have components. Components are just literally data. In this case, the emit count and the particle manager. And then we have systems. Systems actually do like wholesale processing over a lot of entities of, of a given behavior. So if I, if I, if I go to um, an example of a system might be the health system. This is a very simple system. All it is is a function. First of all, uh, and I'm gonna have update particle emitters. Uh, yep, and also receive the grab Excel, CY in a second, and render particle emitters. Uh, we'll see that, we'll, we'll change that after. Okay, so 
let's take a look at a system, uh, a simple system in the game. Uh, this is the health system. And all it is is a function that loops through every single entity in the world, right? The world that we receive. It checks if, they're, if, they, if the entity has a health component. If it doesn't, we ignore it. We continue to skip over that loop. But if it does have a health component, all it does is it sets whether or not the entity is alive uh, to whether or not the entity's HP is greater than zero. So as soon as the HP of the entity hits zero, we delete that or we kill the entity. Similarly, if they're invulnerable for a period of time, we subtract um, you know, whatever time elapsed from that invulnerability time. So, but the main thing to focus on is this function basically processes a whole bunch of entities in bulk. Um, and there are kind of performance benefits to doing this, right? The CPU is running the same piece of code very quickly. Um, and in addition to that, there's simplicity uh, benefits. And also it, it, it kind of localizes a lot of the behavior that you want to uh, you know, put together. So if someone's working on the health system, they know that you know, I can work with all the health logic will be here, right? Uh, they don't have to worry about going to like seven different places to try and understand how health works. And, and this is actually a very nice uh, thing you want to do, right? When you're talking about code structure, like one of the questions earlier, um, you definitely want to try and, because games have a lot, of a lot of cases where they lots of things interact with lots of other things. You want to try and, and come up with a way to make sure those interactions are very visible and clear and easy to write. And this, this architecture is one great way to do that, right? And to, to add focus to your, to your uh, engine. So we were working on the particle emitter system. And this is, again, going to be a very simple function. I'm going to copy all of this, put it here, include my particle emitter system, the header file, and also include a, I guess that's it. That's all I need right now. I also need to include world. Cool. And we're going to speed through this a little bit because we're coming up on time. But basically, we look through every entity in the world. If the entity has a particle emitter component, or if it doesn't have a particle emitter component, or if it doesn't have a fixed position. Mm we're going to skip over it. Uh, fixed position is another component. That's just a position, like a, a, like a point. Uh, and finally, if it does have that, if the particle emitter, we're going we're gonna to say particle emitter manager dot simulate and pass in the gravity acceleration. Because again, the particle manager, if we look at the header file for this, it has a simulate method, uh, receive some, it'll receive a gravity acceleration. We actually have to simulate the particles, right? at some point. So this particle emitter component, we need to simulate its particles. And secondarily, uh, we want to, if the um, particle emitter has an emit count greater than zero, we want to emit particles. Pretty pretty straightforward, I guess. Uh, but emit, uh, and we're going to emit exactly E particle emitter emit count particles. We're going to pass in the position. The position is just going to be the fixed pose of the entity. And then the color for now, we're just going to make it red, hard code it, right? Because time constraints, I guess. Cool. So we've, we've done that. We have particle emitter emit count uh, greater than zero. We're emitting, just taking a quick look over this to make sure we don't make any stupid mistakes. So now we've put the logic of, of simulating particles as well as emitting particles into this component system. Next, we're going to hop on over to our render system. This particular system is, is a class, actually. This is a little bit different than the other systems we have because it has some state that it has to maintain. So when you have state that you want to maintain and you want to couple that with some logic, I typically put that into a structure uh, because it makes it easier to you know, bind the two. Uh, so yeah, in this particular system, we, this, 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 this system handles basically drawing the graphics for all of the entities in the game. Uh, so it handles, if something has an image component, I want to display that image. Similarly, what I'm going to do here is if, um, if it has a particle manager component or a particle emitter component, I'm going to check if it, if it actually does. Here. Skip over this. If not, e image 
continue. If it has a particle emitter component, we're actually going to render the particle, the manager, we're going to render it to our renderer and pass in our camera offset. The camera offset is actually managed by this, this uh, render system. And so we have access to it through this method right here. Cool. So we've set up the camera offset. We've set up the render system. If the entity has a particle emitter, we will render the particle emitters manager. And if it has an image, we render the image down here. OK, perfect. So everything is set up there. And finally, we actually need to, in our level file, so the level is what manages the game level, essentially. Uh, we're going to get rid of our old particle manager here. Or uh, in fact, we can keep it there. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just going to have that fountain spraying the entire time. And we're going to go into our fixed update. This is where we're simulating the game. This is what, what's running 60 times a second. And we're going to include our particle emitter system. And we're going to say update particle emitters. Pass in the world, pass in the gravity acceleration. And now that update loop will automatically be running um, on all the particle emitters in the world. So let's save that just to make sure it compiles. And before we do that, actually, we need to go into our make file, make sure we have a particle emitter system specified here. We're going to compile that quickly. Oh, looks like we run into a compilation error. Head back to our particle system header file. And we're going to include vec2 header because we use it right here. So we're going to make that again. Cool. So the game is running. We're not actually using the particle emitter uh, component anywhere right now. So what we're going to do is whenever the enemy dies, or whenever any anything that has health dies, right? we're going to go into our health system. We're going to include the, or actually, we don't need to include anything. If something dies, so if e, not e.alive, we're actually going to create a new entity. And this is we're not even going to write a factory for this. We're just going to create an entity on the fly here. This entity will have a fixed position. And that position is just going to be a vec2f, uh, whatever the. And let's just say, let's also request that the entity has a body component. Um, we're going to spawn it at the position that the body was placed, uh, rect pose. And this, I'll explain this in a second. But uh, basically, we're going to also add a particle emitter component to the thing. Particle emitter component. And we're going to add this to the world. World add next frame entity. And I want to actually emit some particles. So I'm going to, I mean, right off the bat, I'm just going to set the emit count to, let's make this a tweak value. And let's say we emit 100 particles just for fun. It's kind of a lot of particles, but. Particle emitter component, just checking. All right, I think we should be good. We're also going to need tweaker. Cool. So every anytime something dies and that happens to have a body component on it, we're going to spawn another entity. And this entity is actually just going to be the particle emitter. So we're going to we want to basically have an explosion when something dies of these particles. All right, then I can make the game. Ooh. All right, body component has no member named rect. This is true. I should use the arrow, make j4. And particle emitter component, expect primary expression. Uh, particle emitter component. Uh, open up my entity. That, hmm. that's interesting. Hmm. All right, maybe it's complaining about the tweaker. Yes, it is. All right, um, so just not going to tweak, I guess, at the moment. Uh, it might be because of the syntax of the tweaker itself, uh, macro. So that's technically a bug. Well, we can address that, you know, maybe not during the last five minutes of the workshop. 
but hopefully if I run the game now, shoot the enemy, that's kind of a lot of particles, uh, but it's, it's working. <laughs> and another thing is that there's nothing that actually removes this fountain after a certain period of time. So it's just gonna keep on emitting these particles. Um, another thing is that we probably want to go into a particle emitter system. And after we emit those particles, we want to set the particle emit count to zero. So it doesn't keep on emitting them forever and ever. Although that's not really a problem. It kind of looks nice. Uh, so we actually have a component built for this purpose, like removing something after a certain amount of time. It's called the remove after duration component. And I can actually just put that here. Remove after duration equals remove after duration and then pass in like, let's say one second. And let's just tweak this, tweak. Actually, let's not tweak this because we saw that there was an error when we tried to tweak that earlier. One second. All right, make that. And we are all set, I think. Perfect. So whenever we kill something, it emits a whole bunch of particles. And I think the same will go for the player. So again, the player just has some health. Two, three, four, and this should be the last hit. Yay, all right, awesome. So we have just built particle systems, we've added health, health regeneration, all these things to a game and game engine. We've added custom engine features, components, all these things. So basically everything you would be doing throughout building a game, right? A lot of things uh, involve building engine level features. A lot of things involve building game level features. And the last kind of 20% of a game is polishing. So taking a lot of features and putting them together, working on game balance, all these other things. So there, there's, there's a lot of scope for improvement. So closing thoughts, where to go from here. Uh, basically, you know, games are very, very complicated pieces of software, in my opinion, as far as all the software that I've worked on at different companies. I would definitely say games have, have the most scope, right? There's lots of work to do in networking, in, in physics even, if you're a hardcore math fan, there's lots of that. Um, there's high performance, like low latency things you have to do. Um, there's stuff at, at like the artistic level, like game design and literally art and music, narrative. Uh, there's also, of course, engine, fun times like memory management, uh, doing this kind of art game architecture stuff. So it, it's definitely a, a profession and, and, and a hobby or whatever you wanna uh, approach it as uh, that has a lot of scope for, for providing interesting challenges. And so moving forward with the game that we worked on here, you can do a lot of things, right? You can, you can add more enemy varieties, add decorations like trees and flowers, this, the sky's the limit, right? You can, you can do a lot of things with, with games. And this is just a couple of images of a game uh, that I'm particularly fond of called Braid. And you can see you know, where on the left, uh, there's like a lot of programmer art, but it represents kind of all the concepts that would be in the game on the right, which ended up selling very successfully in 2008, whatever. Uh, it's a puzzle platformer. It's really interesting. I would check it out. And another thing, so that was on like the more broad game, game design side of things. But if you're more interested in the technology, uh, there's lots of opportunities for optimization. These are just very two quick uh, ideas. You know, Entity system right now wastes a lot of memory. Every single entity is, as I showed earlier, every single entity has every single component inside of it, right? So if I were to look at the size of the actual entity class or entity structure, um, it is the sum of the size of all of these. Like it uses however many bytes every single one of these components combined uh, would use, which maybe isn't ideal, especially if you have big components. Um, so, but generally speaking, you could go pretty far with this kind of architecture, right? Most of your, you could have millions of these because entities are still probably only like 200 or 300 bytes big. Uh, but more importantly, I think in a, a more serious concern is the physics system runs O n squared checks. Uh, so this very quickly, you know, uh, will cause problems for you. Uh, if you try to spawn like billions of entities that have physics calculations that happen on them. But when you're optimizing anything, none of it actually matters until you measure. So make sure to use a profiler a debugger, whatever you need to do, add some logging uh, to ensure that you're actually having measurable results with the optimizations that you do. And yeah, have fun. Um, you know, that's that's the workshop. Uh, we covered a lot, so I'm sure there would be questions. Uh, but yeah, if we, if we have some time right now, we can we can go through them, but it doesn't look like we have anything new coming through on the Slido.
Uh, oh, I was missing a parenthesis at, at the previous uh, in 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 one of those. Um, okay, yeah, that would have been helpful. Maybe we can, uh, if there's any questions, if there aren't, we can quickly hop on over, see if that works. Make, yeah, okay, that was fine. All right, just a missing parentheses. But yeah, cool. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you for doing the workshop. Um, yeah, email me if you have any questions, par186 at gmail.com.